Hey, thanks a lot for being here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the other Zoom meetings that we've done over the last couple of weeks, and there will be more to come in the future. Uh, just as a standard reminder, if you're not talking, please mute yourself. Um, that would be very helpful. Um, also, uh, if you have questions, I will be monitoring the chat feature. And um, I'll leave it up to Josh and Jim how they want to handle that, whether they want to take them as we go or just wait till the end. But we will get to your questions. Um, I want to thank uh, Whipley, uh, which is actually the accountants that do the Corfac audit. And a couple of weeks ago, I contacted our auditor since we were going through the process. And I said, oh, could you guys do a program? And he said, absolutely. So uh, Josh and Jim, thank you very much. Uh, I know the presentation you're going to make is going to help not only our members, but their clients as well. Um, and both Josh and Jim have a lot of uh, experience on the hospitality and real estate side and taxation and all that. So they will uh, be sharing some good stuff with you today. So again, please mute yourself if you're not already and uh, if you guys want to take it away, let's roll. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you guys all for joining. I hope everyone's uh, doing as well as possible at the moment with everything going on. Um, just a, a quick introduction. Um, Jim Lockhart and myself, Josh Graham, will be doing the presentation today. Uh, we are both very much tax professionals, so there's, we're going to be focusing a lot on uh, the tax implication of what's kind of uh, happened with the CARES Act and everything that's come out over the last several weeks. Um, Jim helps lead or does lead our construction and real estate practice in Minneapolis, as well as um, is a national resource for Whipley in general. Um, I help lead our Chicago market tax practice in the construction and real estate space. Uh, and just real quick, we uh, work for Whipley. We are a, a top 20 public accounting firm um, spread throughout the U.S. Um, and that's probably all I'll say for now. And just to give you guys a, a quick overview of what we're going to chat about today, um, we're going to just at a high level talk about the CARES Act. We're going to talk about the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have already heard a lot about. So we might kind of go through that quickly unless there are questions. Um, and then there's a, a bunch of different tax update topics that we're going to run through. Um, there are tax law changes that relate to net operating losses and excess business losses that we'll kind of talk about, um, opportunities with qualified improvement property, um, and then a bunch of other changes, and we'll, we'll touch on like-kind exchanges and opportunity zones as well. Um, so a lot of good different tax topics. Uh, so just re real quick before we jump into kind of the meat of it. Um, so the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, um, brand new as of the end of March. And uh, really it was enacted to provide both tax and non-tax support for businesses and individuals alike that are impacted by what's going on with COVID-19 right now. Um, and a lot of these impact the, the real estate industry groups specifically. Um, the provisions can both help current taxpayers um, reduce their future tax liabilities, but also and, and minimize their current tax liabilities um, to help generate cash flow. But it also provides some provisions um, that will allow um, some of this to apply retroactively. The taxpayers might be able to go back and amend the returns and claim um, refunds for taxes that they previously paid. And we'll, and we'll talk about that. Um, so before we get into the tax aspect of things, um, just a couple things to mention um, with the CARES Act is that they expanded unemployment insurance. Um, there are a lot of different emergency lending programs out there. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program probably being the one that gets the most publicity 
So we're going to go through that in a little bit more detail here shortly. Um, there's also other disaster loans and grants out there available for, for taxpayers and businesses. Um, and then there's also um, health provisions and, and payroll credits available. So if you guys haven't heard about those and want to learn more, definitely feel free to, to reach out because we're not going to be able to touch on everything. Okay, so the Paycheck Protection Program at uh, 10,000 feet um, essentially enacted to, to help small businesses with kind of short-term um, operations. So small businesses include really any company that has 500 employees or less. Um, and there are some other um, there are some exceptions as well for companies that do have over 500 employees. Um, but this also applies to those sole proprietors, independent contractors, and those that are self-employed. So you don't just need to apply from, from within a business, but individuals can apply as well. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, so at a high level, the maximum loan amount that people can be applying for, um, it's generally going to equal um, essentially two and a half times your monthly payroll costs, um, with it, the maximum being $10 million. So um, there's a calculation that kind of goes into it, but that's generally what you can be loaned, two and a half times your monthly payroll costs. Um, and that includes wages, commissions, bonuses, um, health benefits, etc., cetera. Um, and that, the number is actually capped um, from an employee perspective um, for individuals that are compensated over $100,000 annually. So if they are over $100,000, then it gets capped at $100,000 in doing kind of the, the calculation of what you can apply for. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and really the intention for what it should be used for, um, at least for the forgivable aspect of things, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, it's, it's to cover your payroll costs, um, healthcare benefits, interest on mortgage, um, rent obligation, and to cover utilities as well. So it's kind of used to, to cover those main um, expenses that, that businesses have. Uh, and we kind of go through that again here. And then one thing to just kind of note is that the borrower needs to self-certify that essentially the loan is necessary to support ongoing operation. Um, and there's not a ton of guidance out on what that actually means, um, but definitely keep that in mind. And I actually heard this morning that I think they're going to be taking a closer look at um, loans that are over $2 million. So um, if you are applying for a loan, that's $2 million or more. If you're in that position for whatever reason, just know it might face a little bit more scrutiny than other loans. Um, and, and the biggest positive about this program is the, is the loan forgiveness. And that's why a lot of people are applying for this. So um, there's, a, there's a very good chance that the entire amount of the loan can be forgiven um, and it wouldn't be taxable either as income. Um, if that were the case, you wouldn't be able to deduct the expenses associated with it, but it's not like a cancellation of debt income or anything. Um, so the terms for that essentially you need to be using over the eight week period that starting when you receive the cash, um, spend it on payroll costs, everything that we've talked about already, um, your utilities, interest on mortgages and rent. Um, and another thing that's come out is that um, if more than only 25% of the loan can be spent on non payroll costs. Um, so if more than 25% of the loan is spent on utility, rent, and interest. Whatever over that 25% mark will not be forgiven. 
and anything that's not used to cover one of these costs that's laid out here will also not be forgiven. Um, Josh, I just think it's important to note, if I might, just real, real quick, is that you know a lot of the a lot of discussion now is about the loan forgiveness and the requirements for loan forgiveness is what you spend it on. There are a lot of unanswered questions. And it's very important that now that people have started to get the proceeds, they've had them for just maybe a week, or not, not even two, is to make sure that you are uh, expending your funds uh, so it can be 100% forgiven. Uh, again, there are many unanswered questions that go into these formulas. It's a formula driven and you should, you and your client should really be working uh, ahead of time with the bank or with your accountants to make sure that you're, you know, doing everything you can and spending it properly so you can have most of it or if not all of it forgiven. Um, uh, hopefully we put together um, internally kind of an Excel model that we're working with clients in our client banks to say, okay, this is where we think it falls. But again, there are a number of really unanswered questions here. Absolutely, good point, Jim. Very good point. Um, and just at a high level, knowing that there are unanswered questions um, in general of how this works, if you, if you spend your money appropriately, primarily on payroll, some of it on some of these other covered costs, utility, rent, interest on your mortgage. Um, like if, if you're spending it appropriately, there are a couple of items that could still reduce your loan forgiveness amount. One of those is, this is based off of your number of full-time equivalent employees. So if that number drops over this time period, if you have less employees, then your loan forgiveness amount will decrease, um, generally pro rata based off of how many full-time employees you had versus you have now. Um, and also it's important um, if your employee salaries are reduced, um, I think it's by more than 25%, yep. you have to maintain at least 75% of what their salary was to, to also still qualify for 100%. Otherwise it gets reduced dollar for dollar below that amount. Um, now for employees that make over $100,000, I think it's capped at $100,000. So you don't need, someone's I'm just making up $500,000, you don't need to pay them the full 500,000, but just up to the $100,000 limit in the calculation. So just kind of wanted to put that out there for people. Hey, Josh and Jim, there were a couple of questions that came in. One was, how do you prove this to the IRS? And does payroll include health insurance for employees? Um, so this is not something that necessarily the IRS is um, going to be looking at. But um, I mean, it's going to be up to the lenders to determine, I think, over a 60 or 90 day period. Um, we might get into that in a minute, um, if it's forgiven or not. So as Jim had alluded to, there's still a lot of uncertainty, but really the more that you can be tracking, saving your receipts, saving all of your payroll expenses, like, so you can prove out exactly how you spent that money, like that's gonna be what your bank's gonna be asking for, your lender's gonna be asking for. Um, so it, track it as much as possible. Um, and as long as you're kind of staying in, in the right buckets and have the right intention, um, I mean, there's still going to be a lot more guidance coming out. The SBA was supposed to release some guidance on Monday, I believe, Sunday or Monday, and some of that's been pushed until May 15th, to my understanding. So we're still not going to have all the answers here for a couple more weeks. Um, but yeah, my best advice for now is just kind of track and do as much as you can to stay organized to prove that you've used this appropriately. Um, to set yourself up to be in the best position to be forgiven down the road. But yes, health insurance for your employees should be should be covered by this. It's an out-of-pocket cash item, so it, it should be covered by this. 
And Josh is right. It's not the IRS that's going to have to approve this. It's the SBA. It, the, the actual law didn't impose these 75% for payroll costs, 25% for these other covered costs. Um, that was the SBA imposing that, those percentages. So let's say someone comes in at 70-30. Is the SBA really not going to allow it if you spend it all on covered costs? We don't know yet. And another you know, unanswered question is from a tax perspective, that if it is forgiven, then you don't need to pick it up into income. But, but what we don't have an answer to, and I think Josh alluded to, is whether or not these expenses are deductible. So if I spend 75% of payroll costs and I get my loan forgiven, can I deduct these costs? We don't have the answer to that right now. And so it's too bad that the SBA is so drag, dragging their feet on, on, on providing guidance because people want to know how, how to spend these dollars now. And, uh, but ho hopefully it's soon. Sorry, Josh. Oh, yeah, not a problem. Yeah, and I mean, it, I hope it's not preventing people from spending these dollars on what they need to be now because they don't have the guidance. So, I mean, I think my best advice is just kind of with the rules that we know, try to follow them as best as you can and really try to just stay organized and save all of your documentation. Exactly. You know, exactly right. I mean, what's a full-time equivalent uh, employee? I mean, they, they haven't defined that yet. And so when you calculate your uh, payroll costs for how much you're eligible for, I mean, you, you can include part-time employees, right? I mean, if, if you regularly hire part-time employees, you, you can calculate that in towards your, you know, amount that you're eligible for. But, but on the back end for testing for uh, forgiveness, it goes to full-time equivalents and, and there's not a lot of guidance. So there's zero guidance on that right now. So again, there's so many unanswered questions. And Jim, we have a couple slides on requesting loan forgiveness. Is there anything else that you want to touch on this topic? No, I, I think once the eight week period is over, you can go in and, you know, you know go, go, to, go to your lender and submit as soon as possible, you know, all of your documentation as to what you spend it on because they have 60 days in which to uh, make a determination. One, is it forgivable and two, how much? So um, again, you know, uh, yeah, everyone should be looking at how they're spending it and just tracking it. Uh, and, you know, as, as long as you hit the ball down the middle of the fairway and try to stay within the spirit of the law, you know, just hope, you know, the SBA comes out soon with uh, guidance. Uh, yeah, so they have 60 days and, you know, yeah, I mean, that's about it from a, from a very, very high level. Yeah, the only, I'll just mention two other quick things and then we'll move on. Um, one is if you did apply for like an economic disaster loan or got the up to $10,000 grant, um, then um, that will impact your loan forgiveness amount because you can't be double dipping in both. Um, there's also like payroll credits potentially out there. You can't be doing both the PPP loan forgiveness and and get the payroll credit aspect. So there's a couple of things that if you're doing the PPP program, you can't take advantage of other things. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is probably a lot of people on this call already know, um, the original funding ran out maybe, I can't remember, maybe two weeks ago, but uh, they finally have refunded for the second round as of Monday. So if this is something that you're interested in but haven't moved forward with yet, now is the time to do it. I'd probably talk to your lender today about it. All righty, so now into the fun stuff, the tax stuff. Um, okay, I just need to get my mouse working real quick. Um, okay, so I think what a lot of people have heard about is this initial, this individual recovery rebate, which I'll just touch on at a very high level. Um, so individuals could get a $1,200 essentially economic impact payment um, from the federal government. And 
So $1,200 for individual, $2,400 for married couples, plus an additional $500 for each qualifying child. Um, and I know that taxpayers have started to get that money directly into their bank account or via check. Um, so if you haven't gotten it yet, I know that the IRS has some tools in order to make sure that you're kind of on their radar. Um, there, there is a phase out for this though. So for individuals that make over 75 grand in a given year or for married couples that make over $150,000 in a, in a given year, there's a phase out of what they can receive. And then, so if an individual makes over 99,000, they will receive nothing. And if a married couple filing joint receives over, makes over $198,000 annually, they will receive nothing. Um, and if you made, if you're under the threshold on one of the two tax years, 18 or 19, um, I think you can still qualify. Um, so other than that, we're gonna, we're gonna pass through this. So now some of the, the bigger ticket items related to the tax law changes, and I'm gonna kick it off to Jim. Uh, thank you, Josh. So, so it's important to understand and, and visit about prior, you know, to getting into some of these new tax law changes is that while the PPP loans and the EID loans are very helpful and to the extent people qualify, they uh, should certainly get them. What a lot of people don't uh, have, haven't fully gotten yet or grasped, and we're working with a lot of our clients right now, is a lot of these tax law changes will enable people that own commercial real estate to uh, get, potentially get significant tax refunds uh, that uh, will far exceed, in some cases, more than what they get under a PPP loan or an EID, IDL loan, excuse me. And, you know, the, the, I mean, this is what I call free money sitting out there to the extent that you pay taxes in, in the a past that, you know, you can go back, you know, we can generate net operating losses, go back and get money that you've paid in in prior years that you don't have to pay back to anyone or, or ask that it be forgiven. So we're, we're busy right now working with our clients and trying to get uh, their tax dollars that they've paid over the past five, five years. So uh, one of the first provisions that changes uh, with respect to uh, net operating losses. So uh, to the extent that you've had net operating losses in 2018, 19, and 20, you can now carry that, those back five years. And so with the uh, Jobs Act, um, the, that, that was changed where you could only carry forward NOLs, and it was subject to an 80% limitation. Well, that 80% limitation is gone. You can deduct 100% of your NOLs, and you can now carry back five years. And there's, a, there's another very significant change is the excess business loss lim limitation in that you were limited to 80%, but further, if you were married finally joint, you're only able to deduct $500,000 of those losses against other uh, income items. So, so now that limitation is gone. You can deduct your losses, if losses against your other income, uh, and this is particularly important for real estate professionals. So now you can, now you can offset all, all, of, all of your income and, and go back five, five years. You still have the passive loss rules at play and the uh, at-risk rules that, that are at play. But generally speaking, uh, we have a lot of clients that, that are taking advantage of this and going back and uh, getting uh, tax refunds. You want to click forward? Or? Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through an example real quick um, to kind of make sure that kind of hits home. Yeah. Um, so we, we generated this. This might, may or may not be based off a real life example um, for a real estate tax professional or real estate professional. I think it um, was a real life example. So um, this is based off of their 2019 income. And again, these law changes apply to 18, 19, and 20. Um, so we can go back and amend 18 if they apply as well. Um, but bef before the, the tax law change with the CARES Act, um, this individual had a little over $1.4 million of losses 
Um, and those losses would have just been eligible to be carried forward to offset 80% of income in any given year. So they couldn't even utilize the full amount and they would be a taxpayer in years where they had taxable income. Um, so then on the right column actually shows the change um, after the CARES Act changes. And so, I mean, one thing you'll notice is that their rental losses actually increased. Uh, and that's something that we'll get into in a second of kind of why that happened. Um, but then on top of that, um, so they've generated a $2.6 million loss. So they are now able to take that $2.6 million loss and carry it back for five years, back to 2014, and claim refunds on taxes that they paid in 14 through 18, um, which is very beneficial because that's tax that you can, that's cash that you can get in your pocket today from the US government on taxes you previously paid. Uh, and another thing to kind of point out is that you actually, you carry it back to the, the oldest year first. So if you had a 19 loss, you'd carry it back to 14 first. Um, so 14 through 17, we actually had higher tax rates than we do in 18 and 19 and going forward. Um, so you'll notice in this chart that like, if you compare 2017 and 2018, um, this, this taxpayer actually had less taxable income in 2017, but paid more taxes because of the difference in tax rates. So my point is that you can generate a loss now and carry it back to years where you paid more taxes and get more money back because of that, because uh, you're at a higher effective rate. So it's actually a, a benefit to be able to carry it back if possible, if you did um, pay taxes in prior years. Right. So, so, right. So this applies for losses that have already been incurred, but we can also do this for 2020. And so to the extent that you have a NOL in 2020 or, you know, looking, Hey, how do I get an NOL in 2020? Uh, this, you can still carry it back five years. So the opportunity exists through, through uh, the end of this uh, year. Taxes. Absolutely. So in, in this instance, the taxpayer is able to um, claim an NOL in 2019, go back and claim NOL carrybacks for 2014 through 2017, because that's kind of how, how much NOL that they have available to offset income and get $780,000 of cash refunded to them from the federal government. So. Hey, John, um, then there's, there's a question about how do you determine what a rental loss is? Um, I mean, probably talk to your um, tax and accounting professionals, but um, it, the, a, a lot of it has to do with depreciation. And we'll kind of go into a, in a quick example of like why this rental loss um, increased so much from 2 million to 3 point, close to 3.2 million. Um, but in general, I mean, these are either going to be coming from K-1s, from like partnerships that you're investing in, or if you have, if you're a sole proprietor or just own rental properties directly, it might be reported directly on your 1040 on your Schedule E, which is for your rental properties. Um, so presumably someone's tracking the accounting, um, but depreciation is a, is a big way to generate losses to, to be able to go back and, and get some tax refunded. You're right. So you can do it through depreciation. There's a deduction called 179B. You can change your accounting methods. Uh, there, there's a number of tools that you can use to generate rental losses. Okay, so moving on, and this will kind of get into part of how they generated um, such a big loss post CARES Act. Jim, do you want to go through qualified improvement property? Yeah, thank you. So, so there was another change is, is, with, is with respect to qualified improvement property. Basically, that's any improvement to the interior portion of a non-residential real estate at any time after the property is placed in service. So, uh, so normally this would have been capitalized under 39 years, but, but now that they made this change, for 2018, 19, and 20, that now can be classified as 
15 year property and be subject to the 100% bonus depreciation. So if you spend a million dollars improving the interior portion of a commercial building, you can now expense that and, and add that to your uh, net operating loss. Excuse me. So, so we're going back to, uh, for clients for 18 and 19 where, where we capitalize these costs. We had probably done a cost segregation study for them to, to identify short, short of life properties so we can take 100% bonus. We're going back and saying, okay, we can now reclassify these assets as short of life property, take 100% take bonus on it now and add to your NOL or create an NOL 18 and 19 and carry it back. We're gonna have the same ability to do that for 2020. So if you or your clients are renovating non-residential building, we, we can now 100% expense any improvements to the interior of that building and to uh, create a loss and go back and get some income taxes paid. Awesome. So we'll just to like talk through how that works. Um, we have an example of, of a cost segregation study that was previously done in Chicago. Um, so there was $10 million spent on the acquisition of, uh, of a retail strip. And originally it would have been depreciated over 39 years. So that's about $250,000 of deductions um, annually. But um, with bonus depreciation, you're able to immediately expense uh, anything that has a, a life of 20 years or less. Um, and so, and the big key is that this qualified improvement property that Jim was just talking about, it was 39 year property and now it's considered 15 year property. So it qualifies for bonus depreciation. So everything, so $10 million acquisition, going through a cost segregation study, 7 million of it, 70% of it's allocated to the building, but 30% is allocated to shorter life assets. So that's, that's significant, $3 million of the 10 million. So this taxpayer is able to deduct $3 million worth of expenses immediately, um, and then plus depreciate the 700,000, or 7 million, sorry, over the, the 39 year life. Um, so this is something to really be taking advantage of now. I mean, it's it a, a couple of comments just to make. Um, one is if, if you know you had qualified improvement property, like, you should be going back and, and amending returns or making a method change most likely to accelerate that depreciation now um, because you can. And if you haven't, if you haven't done like a cost seg yet, um, you're actually, this could apply for new acquisitions, but you can actually, for acquisitions that have occurred previously, you can do a cost segregation study and then you can make a method change that allows you to catch up on any depreciation that you've missed out on until now. So even if you bought a building in 2016, never thought about this, you could do the cost segregation now, do a method change and take all the additional depreciation in 2019, which would hopefully generate an NOL, which then you could utilize to carry back to, to get some um, taxes refunded if you paid taxes previously. Um, so one other thing to kind of, we put this slide together. This is from um, our cost segregation team that kind of just shows by different asset type, generally speaking, like the estimate of how much of it would qualify for bonus depreciation. Um, so obviously each, each situation is different, but just to give everyone uh, a kind of feel for how much additional deductions that they could be getting upfront by kind of going through a cost segregation study. All righty, so we're gonna keep going. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but with the 
all, all these tax law changes that we're talking about were actually um, enacted at the very end of 2017 as the tax cuts in, as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which is same true with this one, 163J, which is your interest expense limitation, um, which previously limited the ability to, to deduct interest expense um, up to 30% of your adjusted taxable income. Um, so with the CARES Act, they've now essentially expanded that for 19 and 20 to now be able to use it for 50% of your adjusted taxable income. So you can deduct more interest expense. Um, however, if uh, we're dealing with partnerships, if it's a partnership tax return, um, a 1065, the, the impact doesn't, doesn't occur until 2020. So it's not something that you would necessarily change in your 2019 return. Um, so just kind of wanted to, to put this out there. I mean, it's, it's also, uh, these are both reasons why if, uh, if 2018 and your 2018 return, you're either limited for interest expense purposes or didn't take advantage of qualified improvement property, it'd be a good reason to go back and, and amend those returns right now to kind of take advantage um, and get some taxes refunded. Um, the big reason why I wanted to bring up this 163J is because there's actually an interplay between qualified improvement property and this interest expense limitation. So essentially there is an exception for the interest expense limitation for um, essentially real estate trader businesses, which said that they could elect out of the limitation if they had wanted to, and they still can, um, starting in 2018. And if they did make that election to not be subject to the interest expense limitation, then for real property and for qualified improvement property, it had to be depreciated over a different, different methodology, um, the alternative depreciation system. Uh, the negative to that is that anything that's being depreciated for ADS purposes isn't subject to bonus depreciation. You can't take bonus depreciation on it. Um, so and it, it doesn't that doesn't apply to if you're a real estate trader business, if you've already carved out costs into like five or seven year buckets, those can still, you can still take bonus on that. But it's really for your qualified improvement property specifically where you get it into an issue. Um, so if you made this election on 2018 or 2019, then currently you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the QIP change that would allow you to take bonus on it immediately. Um, this 163J election was supposed to be irrevocable, but then um, all of this happened. And so they're now making an exception um, for taxpayers to be able to revoke their election that they already made on 2018 or 2019 returns, either by amending those returns or by making a, a method change on, on the following year tax return. Um, so just kind of wanted to make sure people were aware this was out there because this does have, uh, it does impact the ability to take bonus depreciation on qualified improvement property. So something to be thinking about with uh, your tax professionals. I know this is probably um, too much detail for, for some people. Um, so then just wanted to cover a couple other high level things as part of the CARES Act tax updates. Um, as likely most of the people know on this call, um, the, the deadlines for federal purposes for filing tax returns that were originally due on April 15th got pushed to July 15th. Um, same with any Q1 or Q2 2020 estimates that would have been due by individuals or um, corporations that also got extended to July 15th. Um, a lot of states conform to those rules, but not all of them did. So it's uh, important to kind of check out your, your, your home state's um, rules. So for those of you in Illinois, like I am, um, the quarterly estimates Q1 and Q2 were not extended. So those still had Q1 payment for Illinois still had to be made by April 15th. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and then there are some other 
high level changes, um, changes to be able to take more charitable deductions, um, changes to AMT tax relief, which doesn't apply to a lot of people. Um, a, a waiver to um, make withdrawals from qualified retirement accounts. Um, so just some high level stuff for people to keep in mind. With that, we're gonna, I think, transition to 1031 updates, like kind exchanges, and Jim, I'll throw it back to you. Uh, thank you. So, um, so there's an extension for, for the deadlines under uh, section 1031. So the IRS issued this notice 2020-23 uh, to provide that extens extensions of time for uh, exchanges. For 1031. So typically, you know, taxpayers have 45 days to identify or, des or designate their uh, replacement properties and uh, 180 days to complete the, the uh, purchases of their replacement properties. However, under this notice, uh, it prolongs the 1031 exchange deadline periods to July 15th, 2020. If, if your normal deadline fell in between April 1st and July 15th. So, so, so the thought here is, well, since we have the coronavirus and people are stay at home, you're really not gonna be able to go out and look around and try to find replacement property or let alone be able to close our, our, our replacement property. So they uh, picked, you know, your deadline's gonna be extended to July 15th, 2020. And so, you know, hoping this gives taxpayers enough time. If, if it appears that it's not going to, the IRS can always extend that period of time. So, uh, so just, just be aware of that if you are, or, or your clients are in a 1031 and you're within your 45 day window or 180 day window, that has been extended to July 15th, uh, 2020. Awesome, yeah, and if you talk to, uh qualified intermediaries, I know that, or otherwise other professionals, as Jim alluded to, I, I don't think they think that the time frame is long enough at this point. So. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so um, hopefully, hopefully it gets extended further. Because... Yeah, so they're really pushing on extending this past July 15th. And yeah. I think the there's tax guidance out there that said that they should have been extended by at least 120 days post uh, one of these the required date. So anyways, um, hopefully more to come with like kind exchanges. But for now, if you're either 45 day or 180 day windows would have ended between April 1st and July 15th, then you get an automatic extension to July 15th um, to, to meet those requirements, which is great. Um, and then on a very similar note, I don't know how many people on here touch opportunity zones, um, but the 180 day period for investors to invest their capital gains into a qualified opportunity fund um, has also been extended. If their 180 day window would have expired similarly to 1031s between April 1st and July 15th, then that date automatically gets extended to July 15th for now. Um, there's also, um, for people that actually do have funds in place, there's a, there's a working capital safe harbor, which gives you a, a period of time to, to do specific things. And there's another kind of reinvestment period if you do um, sell anything under the QOF. So those have been extended for those that are in federal disaster areas, um, which is the majority of the country. So if you are in the OZ world, you probably know what I'm talking about, but if you don't, um, feel free to reach out. Um, I don't really wanna go into too much detail on opportunity zones, because there is a lot about them. Um, it'll probably just be way too confusing. Um, but the couple things I think to mention about them right now are, one, there might be more investors looking to deploy capital in opportunity zones than one would have anticipated um, because there were uh, a lot of individuals or others that cashed out of the stock market 
um, in February and March and even now um, that weren't necessarily planning on doing so. So they likely triggered gains that they weren't planning on and they might be looking at ways to defer that gain. Um, so they're probably some extra capital sitting on the sidelines right now trying to figure out what to, what to do with that. Um, to just definitely keep that in mind. Um, and there's also, I'm not really gonna go into it, but um, and here's some benefits if you guys didn't know about them, tax benefits. Um, but people that get K gains on K1s have like a very flexible extended period of time to be reinvesting those gains as well. Um, so that's definitely something that a lot of our taxpayers or a lot of our clients are like thinking about. And I mean, one example, just FYI, um, like I have a client that they sold a property um, in February of 2020. Initially, we're thinking to do a like kind of exchange. And now they have their, and it was owned via a partnership. Now they have several options available to them um, because one, they're still within the like kind of exchange period and they're going to try to make that work. Um, but we'll kind of see how things go. But if they aren't able to do that appropriately within the time requirements that they have, because this gain was triggered within a partnership entity, the gain actually doesn't need to start being reinvested. That 180 day clock could start as of December 31st, 2020, or it could start even March 15th, 2021. So they have some flexibility in terms of being able to to use this gain that they have to invest even in 2021, hopefully once we're well past this, um, and still defer their gains that they had incurred in um, February of 2020. Um, so they're, they're keeping their options open at looking at both 1031s and OZs, so just something to keep in mind. Um, with that, I know we only have about 10 minutes left, so I don't know if we want to cover any questions. Hey, Josh, I missed a question at the beginning, and Joe, sorry I missed your question, but I assume it applied to the PPP program. Joe wrote, expense paid previous to receipt of the funds, but after the crisis hit, do not count? Yeah, I think it's the, it's the for the PPP loan, I think it, and I, there might not be 100% guidance out there. The way I understand it, it's the eight-week period following the time you get your, your funds. Um, so anything spent prior to that wouldn't necessarily qualify for the forgiveness because you didn't get the loan at that point. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it, I think it, it has to do with uh, uh, PPP funds being spent within that eight week period. Um, any other questions out there? Either you guys can unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat feature. Um, as past uh, webinars we've done, the slides and the audio recording will be shared with not just you guys, but all of CORFAC. So that'll be on its way shortly. But um, any other thoughts, questions for Jim and Josh? Doesn't look like it, guys, but uh, on behalf of CORFAC and everybody here today, Thank you both very much for taking the time. This was very enlightening, very helpful, um, and appreciate it very much. Yeah, I, you know, I just, I just have just kind of a parting thought. You know, to the extent that you have commercial real estate or you have clients that do, really encourage them just to take a look at their tax situation and see what they can do to either carry back losses or generate losses. Uh, and just go, go back and get those tax refunds. Excellent. Awesome. I, I would agree with that, Jim. Yep. And thank you guys for having us. And yeah, uh, yeah appreciate it. And uh, hope everyone takes care out there. All right. Thank you. Take care. See you guys. Thank, thank you. Guys. you. Hey, thank you. Thank you.